And I, I feel that if we're going to see the kingdom of God's power move in our life and through our life, then we need to get back to allowing God's kingdom to take full rulership and reign over our lives. See, that's what the kingdom of God speaks about. That's what it means. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about God's rulership, God's reign over our life. Where now we live, but we live for Christ and the kingdom of God. We don't live for this world anymore. Amen. We live for God. We live for the kingdom of God. And every believer in every church, according to the word of God that I read in the word, how many believe the word of God is true? Amen. Amen. Is, to, is to live for this kingdom, to live for Jesus, right? Our whole belief system, our whole mentality, everything changes according to the kingdom living. And so, so when Jesus came, in fact, when he started preaching this message, he was saying, he was basically telling people, look, it's time to, to repent, simply to change your ways, change your, your, your way of thinking, your living, amen, change your way, turn away from your sin, turn away from your dead works, and turn to God because the kingdom is coming. And that way you will be saved, you will be prepared, and you will be saved. If you reject it, you will be judged. Amen? You'll be judged. You'll be condemned. So God doesn't send, condemn anybody in realistic. We actually condemn ourselves because of our rejection of the kingdom, the rejection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? And so when he preached this message, after he went from town to town, as, as we talked about, and a movement started. People were getting healed. People were getting delivered. Uh, demons were being cast out of, 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 of sickness and diseases. And those who were oppressed by the devil, they were being set free by the power of God. Every village, every town, every city that he went into, homes were being impacted. Lives were being transformed. Cities were being shaken. And when you read the book of Acts, you kind of see the same type of movement, same type of church continuing on. And it's the same movement that should be continuing on today. But why is it in what they call the global south that it's, 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 it's moving powerfully? But in the global north, like America and Europe, it's being hindered. It's like it's not being unleashed. It's being held back. When something's unleashed, it's let go. Totally let go, free to, to move and, and to operate and to accomplish whatever purpose is designed to accomplish. But when it's not being unleashed, it's being held back. And that's what we see happening here in North America today. And even in the churches today, the same power, it's not, it's not moving the way that God wants to see it move. And I want to be able to be a servant that just humbles himself and says, God, you do what you want to do. And I, I feel more passionate there because I see our people getting sick and the diseases and sicknesses of, of diabetes and heart disease and liver disease and all these other diseases coming in and affecting our people. People that were on fire, people that, that man, want to do something for God. They want to live for God. And all of a sudden, they're sick. They're, they got these ailments, different things. And, and they, I, you know, I, you know, the devil's a liar, man. We need to come against these things because these are the type of people that are going to help us build the work of God. And so in, in, in Matthew, Matthew chapter, chapter 11, verse 12, Jesus said this. He said, until the days of John the Baptist, he says, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by forth. And we learn what that means and what he's saying. In other words, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing since Jesus came and started this movement. The kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing with holy power, pushing back the darkness, destroying the darkness in, in the world and in people's lives. And those that are keen enough to recognize and co with conviction that this is the work of God are pressing into it, are taking hold of it, and their lives are being changed and transformed by his power. And God is raising them up as powerful testimonies of his changing power. What nobody else can do in this world or anything else in this world, Jesus Christ was able to do it. That's what happened in Victory Outreach. That's what happened in this ministry, amen, that was unheard of. 
what we see happening today, amen, God says, I'm going to do a new thing in the church, amen, and he raised up a ministry like ours. Unique, very unique, and created what? He started a movement. He started a movement, and we must continue this movement through us, through our children and our children's children that will continue to spread all over the world. But then in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, which is a reference scripture to uh, Matthew chapter 11, he says this, the, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Now, we talked about a lot of things. In other words, what he's saying there, the kingdom of God advances through two things, two major things, preaching and pressing in, preaching and pressing in, as to convey to you and I, the church today, that if we are going to be a part, partners with God in advancing, forcefully advancing this kingdom with holy power, destroying darkness wherever it is around us, then it must be done with spiritual passion. It must, you can't advance this work, amen, with dead works. You can't advance this work with human philosophy or human wisdom or even human strength. My Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. And you see that it must be advanced. If we're going to unleash this kingdom in VOSB, if we're going to unleash this kingdom in Victory Island International, then it must be proclaimed. The gospel must be proclaimed. The kingdom must be proclaimed with spiritual passion. Secondly, through a passionate pursuit of prayer warfare, where people pray. Thirdly, with an expectation of the miraculous which requires dynamic faith. And then fourthly, with a burning heart for world evangelism. With world evangelism. Now, we're going to look at each one of those. And we started with spiritual passion last Sunday. That we said that if we're going to unleash God's kingdom, then it must be done with spiritual passion. We said, what is passion? Passion is this, any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling towards someone, place, or theme. And I asked you the question, what's your passion? What is it that moves you, drives you, and pushes you, and gets you up every morning? And what, what keeps you going, whether your day's good or bad or whatever, but it, you keep on going? What keeps you moving? What keeps you engaging? What keeps you advancing? What is the momentum of your life? Because how many know that momentum is what you need in life? That's passion. When you have passion, you start to build traction. You start to build momentum. And when you have momentum, you have steam. You have power. You have force. Amen? So that means that whatever life throws at you, whatever comes your way, whatever the devil tries to attack you with, you got such a powerful momentum that it runs it over, it pushes it out of the way, it can't stop you, it won't stop you because you got momentum. You got momentum. Now, how do we get that momentum? There's some of us, we used to have that momentum. And somewhere along the way, we lost the momentum. We used to be on fire. But somehow, now that fire, the world, trials of life, amen, the temptations of life, the, the difficulties of life, somehow has a way of putting out that fire, diminishing that passion. Well, now you're just coasting. You're just cruising, coasting. I like to cruise, but I don't like that kind of cruising. <laughs> and so to get spiritual passion back, so there's certain things that we need to ignite, right? Need to ignite. Yesterday, I, I was, you know, after we got back from Run for Hope, I don't know if you, you've seen it, but I put the TV on, and I noticed that they were doing the series of Rocky. Yeah. Any of you guys see that? Yeah. Right? You know, it has series like that. And he comes, he's a, 
He, he represents Victory Outreach, amen. He was a nobody came, amen, and defeated the champion, right? He defeated the champion. And then, and then he, you know, he, he's there, and then the champion is probably got her. He wants, to, he wants to get it back, amen. He wants to fight him again. He, you know, he has this, this little thing. And so, you know, he fights him again. And he, you know, he, Rocky wins again, whatever. But then after that, there's a third Rocky, right? And the third Rocky, the champion, Apollo Creed, Amen. Uh, you know, started telling you know, uh, you know, he still wanted this, to fight uh, Rocky, but he gets with Rocky. He goes, you know, we need to fight this guy because this guy, uh, what is his name, Clubber Lane, right? You know, he's he's a beast, and he starts he starts you know, Rocky now he's he's living in glory. He's a champion. He's got some money. He's you know he's living he's living large now. You know, I mean, when he, you know, he was a nobody, man. He had, he had passion. He had the eye of the tiger. He was, that, he was hungry, man. And he was able to go in there and give it everything, and he, and he beat the champion. And now he's living large. Now he's blessed. Now he's got a wife. Now he's got a child. Right? See, before, you know, he didn't care if he got beat. Before, he didn't care if they beat him to death, amen, because it was just him. But now he's got a wife. Now he's got a kid. Now he's gotten civilized, a little civilized. And it, I mean, there's so much thing. I was looking at that movie. I said, look at that. Look at this, you know. And this guy starts taunting him. He starts taunting him. He starts, you know, you know calling him out and calling him the Italian chicken. Remember that? You know, you're a chicken. You don't want to fight. You've just been fighting nobodies and fight a real man. And then he started hitting on, you know, saying something about his wife. Oh, whoa, look out, man. And then Rocky got a little upset there. Now he crossed the line. Amen. And so, so he starts getting provoked, and his wife don't want him to fight no more. His wife don't want him to engage anymore. His wife don't want him to get back in that ring anymore. His wife, you know, kept telling him, no, that's it. It's over. It's done. I don't like it. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, this and that. And so, but he's provoked by this man. He goes, no, I got to do this, man. And they're arguing. They're going back and forth. And, and she's telling him, no, you can't. And he says, look, Adrian, look, look. I've never asked you to stop being a woman. Don't ask me to stop being a man. I hope some women are listening to this here tonight. Some of you are called of God. Some of you are called to take cities. Amen. And so it goes on. Uh, he ends up fighting. And he lost. He lost. And he was done. It's over. Devastated. A broken man. Lost all dignity. Everything. Just done. And that's when Apollo Creed came back and told him, no, you got it in you. You can beat this man. He said, I'm going to train you. Then you owe me a favor, right? I'm going to train you. I'm going to work with you. And, 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 and basically he was, a, he was done. He was dead inside. He was alive, but he was dead. He lost his trainer. He lost everything. Before, like I said, it, wasn't, it was just him. Now he's got a family, a wife, and so the way that Apollo Creed was going to train him, he goes, you got to get this, you got to get this passion back. You got to get that passion back. You, you lost this passion. You lost it. It, it. You know, somewhere along the way through all these troubles, all these situations that happen that come against you, you lost that hunger, that passion. He says, you got to get it back. So he takes him out of the comforts of the, the celebrity gym takes him to Los Angeles into the ghetto. <laughs> Goes in to the ghetto right there, and he walks in, he brings him in, right? He's dressed real nice. You know, he, don't, he, he sticks out like a sore thumb. Him and his wife and Paulie. Paulie's a trip, amen? <laughs> And he goes in there, and when he gets in there, right, he says, he, he, they, everybody stops. They walk in, and all the boxers, they're boxers, and they stop, and then they look at him. And for a moment, they're looking at him, and then that's where Apollo Creed tells him, you see? He says, look at their eyes. Look at their eyes. He says, that's what you had when you beat me. The eye of the tiger, he tells him. 
the eye of the tiger. He goes, that's what you got to get back. That's why we're here. That's why we went back to the beginning, back to when it all started, amen, back to the ghetto, back to the streets, amen, back to where, where, where it all started for us, amen, when somebody had enough guts to come, that had the, enough passion and had the eye that was hungry for souls, came to our neighborhood, came into our darkness, our muck, came into our messed up, miserable life, came to our prison cell, came into our jail, and began to tell us that there was a God in heaven that had the power to change our life, that it didn't have to be the way it's been, but that God Almighty was more than able. Someone's got to get that passion back. And the way to get the passion, sometimes you got to go back to the basics. Go back to where your first love was at. What was it that stirred you, excited you, and moved you? What's your passion? Someone's needed to get it stirred up again, amen? Now, what are some of the things that, that could ignite this passion again? Well, the things that always ends up igniting my passion is, is the need. The urgency of the need. Turn your Bible in John chapter 9, verse 1. I'm not going to be too long, but John chapter 9, verse 1. In John chapter 9, verse 1, here's a story of a blind man that was just sitting on the wayside begging. And Jesus and his disciples happened to be walking by. Probably Jesus wasn't even, he was just walking by and his disciples stopped and asked him a question. This, this is what it says. Everybody have it? Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Then Jesus answered and said this, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God, the glory of God, should be revealed in him. And this is where it says, listen carefully. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For night is coming when no man can work. I am the light of the world. And as long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Now, when you read this passage, when you look at this whole scene here, what do you, what do you see? What do you sense? What I sense is I sense Jesus trying to convey to his disciples the urgency. The urgency of his time being here on planet earth. You see, Jesus was sent from the Father. He left, the Bible says, the glories of heaven and was willing to take on the form of a man, the form of a servant, come into this earth, come into this world and serve and eventually give his life as a ransom for the world, right? That was his mission. And when he came and started his mission, he laid out clearly his mission statement that the Spirit of God was upon him for this purpose, no other purpose, this purpose. God had anointed him to preach the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel, to preach the good news to the poor, the hurting, the broken, the troubled. And the Bible shows us that he was straight to work. He, he didn't waste any time. He had spiritual passion. He did the work of his father with passion. Nothing moved him. Nothing swayed him. Nothing stopped him. They called him names. They misunderstood. People rejected him. People said all kinds of, but did that stop him? No. He stayed the course. He remained with the eye of the tiger, hungry to do God's will, fulfill his father's business. That's our Lord. That's our leader. Jesus Christ. He's a man's man. And so you see, when he said this, he basically conveyed to us, he said, look at I do what I do because there's an urgency. I can't waste any more time. He says, look, I must do the works of my father while it is day. What does day speak of? Opportunity. 
Right? When it's daytime, it's opportunity to go do things, right? When it gets dark, you can't see. Time to put everything away, lock everything up, go inside, have dinner, whatever. It's dark. Can't do things, certain things outside, right? Opportunity's over. Time to pack it up, roll it up. Day speaks of opportunity. What Jesus is saying, as long as it's daytime for me, as long as I have opportunity, as long as I have breath, as long as I'm in this world, I'm going to do the works of my Father who sent me. For night is approaching when no man can work. In other words, once nighttime comes, that's it, it's done, it's over. Nighttime for Jesus was the cross. Nighttime for Jesus was, was dying on that cross. Once he died, buried, and resurrected, there's no more that he can do physically himself on this earth. The only way he can continue his work on this earth was through his church, which is the body of Christ. His hands, his feet, his voice, his eyes, his ears, his heart. So he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for night comes when no man can work. I must do this work while I have opportunity. You can sense the urgency that Jesus felt concerning his mission. In another scripture, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he said this, I come to seek and to save those that are lost. Those that are lost, those that are blind, those that are in their sin, those that, are, that don't know the truth, those that, that are, are have strayed away from God. I come to save those that are lost. Another scripture he said in Mark 10 verse 45, he says, I didn't come into this world to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, when the disciples asked him, when he, they came, they went to go buy food, they came back, they seen him talking to a woman. They said, Master, you must eat something. It's been a long day. He replied by saying, look, the kind of food I have and I eat, you know nothing about. And then they said, did somebody bring you food while we were gone? Jesus said, no, my nourishment, my life, what I live for, what keeps me going, what drives me, what moves me, what gets me up every morning, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and finishing that work. That's passion. That's our example. That's our leader. It all speaks of the urgency. It all speaks of the urgency. Now, why is there an urgency for us today? Why should there be an urgency for us today? Look at us here. We are in church. Some of you be looking good, man. You smell good. Your hair looks good. Uh, some of you got your hair whipped over here to the whipped over here. <laughs> looking good. And we didn't used to always look like that. People come and they greet us. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. How you doing? But before people seen us coming, they went to the other side of the street. <laughs> not all of us. I know. Not all of us. And, you know, we look good. Right? Things have been good. Some of you actually live in large now. Live in large. Now you were extra large, too. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Forgive me, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Triple X and double X. <laughs> I don't know who, who, how it... Who planted that seed in the mind? I don't know who it was, but they gave me my Run for Hope t-shirt, man. That was large, extra large. It was big. I put it on. I said, man, I can't wear this, man. I can't wear this. We were looking good. But the fact remains that there's a lot of friends, family members, and loved ones and people out in the world that don't look too good. They look like we used to look. And I'm not just talking about being a drug addict or 
depressed, broken. Mothers, there's mothers here that your hearts were broken. I mean, you were desperate for your sons, your daughters that were, were in jail or prison or the streets. I mean, can you remember every time at night when that phone rang, how you felt, how your heart felt? Remember that? Remember how, how, how desperate you were looking for ways and how some people have spent, parents have spent thousands and thousands upon thousands of dollars trying to help their son or daughter in programs, right? There's still a lot of parents like that, fathers, mothers, aunts, grandmas, that were just like us, just like some of you that are still out there. So when you talk about why should there be an urgency today for the church, I'll tell you why, because the world is still in a desperate situation. The world is still in a desperate condition. And this blind man, listen carefully, this blind man that we read about here represents many that are in the world today. You know why? Because of his condition. Because, let's look at the comparison for a moment. You got a little bit of time? Let's look at the comparison. First of all, this man was born blind. He was born blind. And the Bible tells us there are many in the world today that are spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says this, the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? Who's the God of this world? Who's the God of this world? Satan, the devil, old Slewfoot, Big Red, whatever you want to call him. He is the prince and power of the air, the ruler of darkness. He is the ruler of this world, the God of this world. He says the God of this world has blinded their eyes from the truth. And if their eyes have been blinded from the truth, that means that they have gone on in life believing the lie. The philosophies and ideologies of the, of the world, amen, they believe the lie. And therefore, they, they can't believe the truth. Jesus said this, listen to this. For judgment I come into the world that those that do not see will see. And those who see will be made blind. And those who are made blind are those who remain in their sin and remain lost. Jesus came into the world for those that were spiritually blind like many of us. But when we believe that little bit of faith, of, of ounce of faith that believe, it opened our eyes to receive the truth. And now we're set free because the Bible says the truth shall set you free. And those that see, that think they know everything, he says, I come so they can become blind. And those that are blind remain blind, therefore they remain in their sin and therefore remain lost. Isn't that heavy? Remember the publican and the beggar? Right? See, there's people in the world that are spiritually blind, church. There's people all around us. Every time you go to work, there's people that are spiritually blind. You go to your school, they're blind. You try and share, that's why some of them come against you. They can't stand you. You antagonize them. You, because they can't see the truth. They, they can't handle the truth. And they're, they're, they're spiritually blind. They can't see. And then even those that are hurting, those that are out there that we're talking about, that are desperate, that feel hopeless, that are in need, they, they're blind. They can't see, many of them, that there's hope. They can't see that there's an answer. They can't see that there's a way out of their drug addiction. They can't see that there's a way out of their gang life. They can't see that there's a way out of their poverty, out of their pain, out of their misery. They're spiritually blind. They're spiritually blind to the fact that Jesus Christ is able to set them free, that Jesus Christ is able to bring hope, that Jesus Christ is their answer, and therefore they remain in their sin and they remain lost. But this is why Jesus Christ has commissioned us, the church, to go and to preach this gospel with spiritual passion and bring the light of the gospel to those that are blind. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do it? God is saying to us, the time is now. Jesus said, I must work the works of God now. 
Ecclesiastes 9.10 says this, whatever you find your hand to do, he says, do it with all your might. That's passion. Do it with passion. With, with strong emotion, desire. Because there's no work in the grave. Did you hear that? There's no work in the grave. He says, whatever you find your hand to do it with all your might, for there's no work in the grave. In other words, while you, it's daytime for you, we got to stay busy. Working for God, working for the kingdom. That should be our life, right? Because once you're dead, that's it. It's over. It's final. You can't tell your homeboy no more. You can't tell your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your mom, your dad, your parents no more. It's final. I like the way Moses put it in Psalms 90, verse 12. He said, Lord, teach me to number my days. Moses was up in years already. Huh? He was a classic. But even being a classic, he wasn't retiring. He was refiring, rekindling his passion. And he said, Lord, teach me to number my days. In other words, while I still have life, while I still have breath, amen, while I still am in this world, uh, Lord, help me seize every moment. Help me seize every opportunity to do what I must do for your pleasure. I mean, no, there's an urgency. And this blind man represents those that are spiritually blind in the world. They're desperate. They can't see that there is hope. They can't see that there's an answer. They can't see that Jesus Christ is the one. Secondly, when you look at this blind man, he was born blind. Therefore, he lost all hope and dignity of life. Found himself begging for bread with shame. Can you imagine that? Standing on the corner, begging for bread with shame. No more dignity. He lost all dignity, all self-respect. I need a handout. Can you help me, please? Many of us were there at one time, right? No dignity. Didn't matter how we smelled. Didn't matter how we looked. Because there was a hunger. Either it was a hunger for food or hunger for drugs. And that's what drove us. Didn't care about ourselves. Didn't even see, care how we looked. Lost all dignity. This blind man found himself in that condition. And there's many people in the world today that have found themselves in the very same condition, lost all hope and all dignity of life, begging for bread. Which, let me tell you something. What, what child, what little boy ever grows up or little girl grows up thinking that their life would turn out the way it turned out? Can you think about that? Remember the, when you found yourself in the condition you're in, the, think of the worst condition that you can remember in the world. There, when you were little, a little boy, little girl, no, in, not in your wildest dreams did you ever think that you would turn out this way. I never thought that I would end up doing the things that I did, being in the condition that I was in. What mother, what mother giving birth to this child would ever think that she would have to look into her, uh, her child's face and see the hopelessness and the desperation and the despair of a drug addict, of a convict, a criminal. What mother would ever think that she would have to go and look at her child living in a cage? It's not natural. It's not normal. That's not supposed to happen. Losing all hope and sense of dignity. This man found himself in that condition. And he represents many people out there still today. It's like the man with the withered hand. You've heard me say this many times before. He was the same way as this man here. And what's interesting is this, and this is why I love this story, because the, one of the apocryphal letters say that this man, the man with the withered hand, amen, found himself begging for bread with shame too. But he wasn't born this way like this man. In fact, one of the apocryphal letters say this about this man, that he was a stonemason by trade. You know what that tells us? That tells us that his hands was how he earned his living. His hands was how he earned his living, how he, 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 you know, he, he, he survived, how he lived, how he took care of himself, maybe even a family. 
But something happened in his life, something happened in his journey of life that that which at one time was so promising, so full of life, so full of potential, all of a sudden begin to wither away and die. And therefore found himself in this desperate condition begging for bread with shame and because he was sick and tired of being sick and tired and somehow, some way, deep down inside, he knew, he knew that he wasn't to be like that. There was more to life than what he was experiencing. And therefore, the Bible says there in Luke 6 that one day he heard that Jesus came to town. Jesus stepped into that synagogue over there, the church of that day, and he said, if that's the same Jesus that I heard that was going from town to town, village to village, opening blind eyes, making crippled men walk, and cleansing lepers, if that's the same Jesus, then maybe, just maybe, there's hope for me. So he went to church that day. And when he got to church, my friend, he got his breakthrough. He got his miracle. And it was Jesus. It was Jesus Christ that gave him back his dignity. It was Jesus that gave him back hope and purpose and reason for living. Oh, hallelujah. That's us, Victory Outreach. That's many of us, oh God. Thank you, Jesus, for his amazing grace that gave us hope and dignity back into our life. Thirdly, because of his condition, he found himself begging for bread with shame. He was limited. Because of his condition, he was limited what he can do for himself and limited what he can do for others. Limited. In other words, he was the type of person that couldn't move on in life. He was stuck in life. Never able to move on in life. Never able to get another family. Go, go to work like a normal person. Get a job. Have a car. Have a home. Have a family. He was stuck. Never growing. Never moving forward. Never advancing in life. That was like many of us. Until Jesus came. Until Jesus came. He was desperate. This blind man was desperate. And because of his condition, the disciples asked the question, who sinned, this man or his parents? Huh? Jesus said, neither of them. He says, but this is for my glory. This is so the works of God will be manifest in him. You were desperate. I was desperate. There's people out there that are desperate. Let me tell you something. Whenever you run into somebody that is desperate, whenever you run into somebody that's found themselves in this condition of hopelessness, I want you to know that as long as you have faith in God, listen, all things are possible with God. As long as you have breath, as long as they are, have breath, there is hope. Can you say amen? And I want you to know, anytime you run into, anytime I run into somebody, somebody that looks desperate, hopeless. The world says there's no hope and beyond hope. When every time I go into cities that are drug infested, gang infested, with crime riddle, whatever, and people say, don't go in there. They are perfect candidates. They are perfect soil for the glory of God. For God's power, God's mercy, God's love, God's compassion to be revealed in their life, just like he did in our life. It's for the glory of God. So when you look at them, don't look at their condition. If you do, let it move you with faith to say, you know what, it doesn't have to be this way. The devil's a liar. Come here, let me pray. Let me introduce you to a man that is able, more than able, to do above and beyond what you could ever imagine. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our deliverer. Jesus is our healer, my friend. And that's the only answer, victory outreach we have to give anybody. Oh, you can go to the home, but the home don't save you. You can come to church, but the church don't save you. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. His blood. And what he did on the cross for you and me, that's what'll heal you, that's what'll save you, my friend. 
every head bowed and every eye closed all over this place as the Spirit of God moves upon your heart I don't know who I'm talking to here today I know I'm talking to the church we need to feel the urgency if there's ever a time to reach our communities our neighborhoods to plant these life groups in every city around the Inland Empire to build this church and fix up this church is now it's now, not tomorrow, not next week, now. That's why I just moved by faith. Tear it out, let's do it. And we started doing it by faith. And I thank God many of you responded here this morning. But that's one thing. What about the souls of men, the souls of people, the souls of human beings that are lost and bound and blind? That if somebody doesn't go and tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ, they're going to slip into a Christless eternity forever. They're going to be lost forever. The urge is to keep telling them and loving them and showing them God's love. There's some of you here right now that are in this church. You've been invited by a friend, a neighbor, a relative, or whoever. And you're here today. And you're desperate. You came with a desperate need in your heart, looking for answers, looking for change. Look, God, if you can help me. I've tried everything there is to try. I, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. That's desperation. And I'm telling you, desperation is like a magnet to the love of God, the heart of God. God will never despise or reject a broken heart. He loves you today. He loves you today. Doesn't matter what you've done, where your life has been. As long as you have breath, there's hope. Jesus is our hope here today. And I want to pray for you. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. There's someone here that needs Jesus. Pray, church. They need God in their life. They need God in their marriage. They need God in their family. They need God to come into their son's life, their daughter. And I want to pray for you. Is anybody here today, you say, Pastor, please, I need God. I need God in my life. I need Jesus in my life. If God, if Jesus can help me, I've been searching, I've been looking for answers, looking for change, and I, I just can't do it, man. Prayer programs can't help me. People can't. I need God. If there's anybody here, you need God like that in your marriage or your whatever, I want you to raise your hand quickly and I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? I need Jesus. I need Jesus. That's God's love. That's God's love. We're going to sing this song. Come on, let's stand together. Come on, stand together with me. We're going to sing this song. And those of you that, that need prayer, you want prayer for salvation, I want you to come. And then if you're here and you need prayer for healing, I want you to come. You need prayer for healing. We heard the, the announcement. You need prayer for healing. I want you to come. God's kingdom power is more than able to touch and heal and save.